All right, so let's talk about chemicals and food. All right, all right, what's going on, guys? My name is Tyson. I am a fourth year PhD student in chemistry at Yale University slash UC Berkeley. And my goal for this video today is to help you to understand the different chemical additives that you can find in food and talk a little bit about the purposes that they serve. There's been a lot of talk about the decrease in quality of our foods and chemistry has showed quite a bit of this blame, but I've not seen as much conversation about why these additives are there in the first place. I just see mad people talking trash on my discipline, like, yo, chill, take it easy. A lot of this stems from the fact that people don't really understand food as well as they think they do. But worry not, I got you. I'm here, bro. Don't even worry about it. I'm finna talk to you a little bit about what these chemicals are up to and why just taking them smooth out of food may not necessarily be an immediate solution. But in order to get us on the same page, I want to start by telling you a secret. Come here, come here. You see, by default, food is actually highly chemical in nature. A review from Central Science Lab in the UK described food as a heterogeneous mixture of chemicals both natural and man-made. That's pretty eloquent. You see, the human body is like a giant reactor. There's an overwhelming amount of chemical reactions that are occurring in your body at any given time. From a biochemical standpoint, we eat food to deliver the necessary chemicals that your body needs in order to perform these chemical reactions. These reactions give us energy and generally keep us uh, not dead. And so everything in food is a chemical. Proteins are chemicals, carbs are chemicals, fats are chemicals, all of it. Take this structure for example. It looks pretty chemicalish, right? You've probably never seen it depicted in this way, but you definitely know it by its name. This is vitamin C. If you're a biochemist, you probably recognize it as ascorbic acid. But its true chemical name is R5S12-dihydroxyethyl34-dihydroxyfurane-25HO. Definitely out of control and definitely sounds a lot less nutritious now, doesn't it? As a further example, this, erythorbic acid, is a common chemical additive. Can you spot the difference between it and vitamin C? Pretty similar, right? What I'm trying to communicate is that a lot of these chemicals are a lot less foreign than people make them out to seem. The FDA breaks down chemical additives into six major categories. For this video, we're going to focus on the first category, preservatives, which further breaks down into antimicrobials, antioxidants, and anti-browning agents. Hey yo, check me out real quick. If you guys enjoyed this video, definitely make sure to let me know in the comments down below and then we can explore some of those other categories in the future as well. Now, I'm a little small channel trying to grow right now, so any love that you can leave your boy will go a long way. All right, much appreciated. But back to preservatives. It's likely obvious to you that the need for preservatives and food stems from the fact that not many people grow their own food these days because nobody got time for that. After being grown and harvested, food has to travel long distances and then sit on shelves for days, sometimes even weeks, waiting to be purchased and consumed. Preservatives help to make this possible by interacting on both a chemical and a biological level. I'm gonna switch it up on y'all real quick and start with the biological. All right, and so the important thing to note is that in many cases, you should be less afraid of the chemistry and more afraid of the biology that is there to replace. For real. You see, you're not the only organism that's interested in eating your food. My G, you got a lot of competition from microorganisms such as Salmonella and Staphylococcus, and uh, they don't play around. They're ah! going to kill you to get it. One of the primary jobs of preservatives is to kill them before they kill you. Some of the most common antimicrobial agents added to food are benzoic acid and benzoates, sorbic acid and sorbates, and nitrates and nitrites. Benzoic acid is a bacteriostat and a fungostatic, meaning that it prevents the growth of bacteria and fungus respectively. Many berries such as cranberries and blueberries produce large amounts of it naturally in order to protect themselves from infection. Typically, you'll find it in the form of sodium benzoate, which is roughly 350 times more soluble in water than benzoic acid. It is used almost exclusively in low pH foods such as sodas and fruit juices where benzoic acid can be generated in situ via protonation of its carboxylate. For foods with higher pH, as well as fancy stuff like cheeses and wines, potassium sorbate is typically used instead. Fun fact, potassium sorbate is actually one of the absolute safest additives available. In fact, normal table salt is technically more toxic than potassium sorbate is. Nitrates and nitrites are typically used in meats. In addition to helping to kill bacteria, they also contribute to the flavor and reddish pinkish color of most meats. It also helps to prevent the production of Botox, which, fun fact, is a neurotoxin. That's why some of the people who use that joint be looking like that. Ah! 
The addition of ascorbate, aka vitamin C, to meat curing helps to slow down the production of nitrosamines, which are generated by addition of amines to nitrosonium ions and can be harmful to the body at high concentrations. Ascorbates react with nitrite to rapidly produce nitric oxide as well as dehydroascorbate. Finally, nitrates are typically used in slow curing processes as it slowly breaks down into nitrite, generating a constant supply over time. So whereas antimicrobial agents help to protect against biology, antioxidants and anti-browning agents help to protect against chemistry. So keep in mind that we said that all food is naturally chemical. This means that in the time between when the food is harvested and when it's consumed, there are a lot of unfavorable reactions that can occur. Antioxidants and anti-browning agents are added to food in order to stabilize its natural chemicals to ensure that that food stays as tasty for as long as possible. Generally speaking, antioxidants prevent unfavorable oxidation of foods by oxygen in the air. This is crucial for extending shelf life and impeding decay, especially in foods with a high fat aka lipid content such as cheeses, meats, and potato chips. When the fats in food are oxidized into noticeably less delicious versions of themselves, this is referred to as becoming rancid. Yeah, rancid foods are actually foods with oxidized fats. I bet you ain't never know that, did you? But don't worry, I got you. That's what I'm here for. I got all the intel for you. So stick around. Oh yeah, and do me a favor, like this video real quick. Antioxidants function by literally jumping in front and sacrificing themselves in order to preserve the fats. They basically push the fat out of the way when oxygen is coming in order to be oxidized in their place. The most common examples you'll see are ascorbic acid, aka vitamin C, tocopherols, aka vitamin E, citric acid, potassium sodium tartrate, BHA, BHT, TBHQ, as well as a bunch of other stuff. Anti-browning agents play a pretty similar role. As their name implies, they literally stop food from turning brown, which is low-key kind of racist, but it's alright. Primary source of browning in food is a natural enzyme polyphenol oxidase, but usually goes by its street name, PPO. PPO converts polyphenols to quinones when exposed to air, for example, like when you cut an apple. This also contributes to damaged fruits turning brown, because now the enzymes that were once inside of it have become exposed to the air at the puncture point. Many of the antioxidants such as vitamin C that were just mentioned can be used for this purpose as well by, once again, dying very honorable deaths in the name of food preservation. A moment of silence for their bravery. In addition to antioxidants, you'll also see some other things such as sulfite and other sulfur 4 derivatives that can interact with the products of the enzyme in order to slow down the browning process. And just like that, those are the three major categories of food preservatives. As for toxicity, I think it's super important to understand the effects that the vendors who want to sell us their products have in shaping our conclusion. Truth is, anything can be toxic especially some of those relationships y'all be in. Check out scientific dating advice. It's never really a question of if something we put in our body can kill us. It's always a question of how much would it take to kill us. You can literally die from drinking too much water. Water is basically the healthiest substance on the planet. We've seen far too many times how people can die from overdosing on chemicals that are even considered normal in food, such as ethanol, aka alcohol, sucrose, aka sugar, and sodium chloride, aka table salt. And so food additives are not there to hurt you. If anything, they're there to help you. It's important to be informed. With that said though, it's not unreasonable to be unhappy with your current selection. If you're sufficiently interested, this could be an active area of scientific research for you. Science is about finding ways to improve our available selections and enhancing the quality of the resources available to us. Maybe you'll be the one to bring our foods closer to perfection. Just make sure you let them know that your boy Tice was the one who gave you the idea. Anyway, guys, if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate if you like and subscribe. Also, as I mentioned, I'm still in the early stages of growing this channel. We're all about having fun while still learning something new. So if you have a friend who you think would enjoy this type of content, definitely hit him up. Send him this video so that, you know, he or she can join the community as well. Finally, if you're interested in staying up to date with me and the channel, make sure you follow me on Instagram at Fresh Professor. I do a lot of updates on my life as a young black kid from Jersey who's been killing it at elite institutions like Yale and Berkeley, and it's also the best place to find info on when to expect new videos, etc. Alright folks, thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.